Hey guys, Ricky here, and just wanted to give a quick intro to this podcast. This is with Colonel Lewis Orndorff. I would refer to him as uh, the sensei of government contracting. He was a contracting officer, retired colonel. I worked with him quite a bit. I was a program manager, so I was managing contracts. He was the contracting officer putting companies on contract and then went on, as you'll hear in the podcast, uh, to have an amazing career. Uh, multiple times a commander in the Air Force, retiring as a colonel. You know, we first met in Saudi, well, I shouldn't say that. We first met in Boston because we were both going out to Saudi Arabia to do a one-year remote, which is one year you have to spend away from your family. And typically one-year remotes aren't easy and that's and you can't bring your family with you. Um, the payoff is typically you can uh, pick your next military assignment. So you know, I think we were both getting close to the point where we wanted to retire and kind of pick where we landed. That's certainly what I was doing. And uh, we just had a, a fantastic time in Saudi Arabia, both uh, managing and working in foreign military sales. Um, we started a band. He played bass in my band. Uh, and, uh, you know, it was, it was just a great time. We had a lot of great work together. And then we went on after we were both retired to help small businesses in various capacities. You guys have heard kind of agnosium, some of the things that I work on, but pay attention to some of the tips that Colonel Warndorf gives you in this. You know, he has helped uh, many small businesses. A lot of clients of mine will, will come against a, a contracting issue that you need an expert to help you resolve. There's, there's no way to really understand all of the federal acquisitions regulations and the DFIRS and all the things that come up when you're actually on contract working with the government. Um, and, and if you have a problem like that, please feel free, reach out to me and we can talk about how Colonel Orndorff can work on that issue. Or if you just have a proposal that you want a contracting officer to review, uh, he has been able to change some of the language. He understands the nuance of what COs put into these RFPs. So we can read the RFP, read your proposal, and uh, give you some advice on just to make you a little bit more competitive. Now, our podcast, so you know, we are designed to help you the small business owner sell products and services to the U.S. military. We interview subject matter experts. We interview successful businesses. And I have DOD Contract Academy, which you can go to dodcontract.com if you want step-by-step -step guidance on how you can go through the process from soup to nuts, from registering to advanced selling techniques. Uh, we have a, a monthly membership program where it includes training on most everything you can think of, plus uh, group weekly coaching by me. You'll get to be with other companies and other sales professionals that are trying to sell to the government. This is great for sales teams, business owners, people trying to understand the process and to get the subject matter experts that I bring on like Colonel Orndorff, myself, and there are others on the podcast and also in the academy that are designed to help you in your unique situation so you can start winning and continue winning those six, seven, eight figure contracts with the military, with other federal organizations. And right now, well, this is January 2023, so I can't promise this will be up forever. But right now, I do have an assessment that you can take. If you haven't started, if you just have an idea that you're thinking about selling to the government, uh, you can take our assessment. It's free to take the assessment. And uh, there is a piece at the end. There's just a few questions you can fill out. If you go to dodcontract.com, click on you want to take the assessment. And while it's up, uh, I will review your answers uh, and send you a quick uh, Loom video on, you know, what we're seeing as far as federal spending in the area that you're considering. What does competition look like? You know, this is quick. It's not in-depth. There is an option for you to do a paid consultation and review that'll be a little bit more in-depth, but you don't have to do that. So again, while it's up, probably for the next couple of weeks, uh, you could take that assessment. But now that I'm done with our initial commentary there, let's go on to the podcast and hear my interview with uh, Louis Orndorff, which I know you're really going to love. All right, take care. Thanks, everyone, for listening to DOD Contract Academy podcast. Today, I have a, a veteran, a veteran of the podcast and a, a veteran of the U.S. Air Force and someone that you have heard before if you've been listening to our episode. So, Retired Colonel Lewis Orndorff, how are you today, sir? Doing great. How are you doing? I'm doing awesome. So we've been chatting here for about a half hour before getting into this. And uh, so for, for everyone that doesn't know, so we served together, right? Um, Saudi Arabia. We were in a band together. 
right? You played bass in our band. Yeah, you you uh, you were teaching me how to play bass. Uh, let's well, let's put it that way. Well, you picked it up. You picked it up really uh, really quickly. So uh, we had we had the the best band in uh, Riyadh. I can tell you that. So for sure. For um, sure. Sure. But uh, and so now we work together more. Now we're both retired and, and kind of consulting and doing our different uh, businesses. But as it relates to public sector sales, and um, you know, you have a, a, a very interesting history. So I just wanted to, you know, I wanted to let everyone get to know you before we get too uh, into the weeds on like contracts, federal contracting, the, the opportunity for both small and large businesses out there. Who's who's Lewis Orndorff? You know, where where'd you go? I'm interested. Like, where'd you grow up? Why'd you join the Air Force? Oh wow, that is a that is a question. I'm going back. You weren't expecting that. That's why I didn't. No, I wasn't expecting that. Didn't want to prep you. (laughs) I grew up in a little tiny town in Idaho, and uh, actually actually graduated from a very small town uh, called Bliss, Idaho. Um, And uh, I went to the University of Idaho uh, when I graduated from there, and uh, was studying physics and uh, mathematics. So um, with my Air Force. uh, career starting uh, by joining the Guard, okay. uh, the Idaho Air National Guard. I actually started out as a, uh, uh, called the Cold War era uh, reconnaissance uh, troop. Okay. We would do uh, F-4s that would fly in low over the enemy territories, running uh, cameras and film, and I would uh, help develop the strike packages as a very brand new uh, young uh, airman. And then I ended up working on a uh, Uh, enjoying that so much that um, I decided when I graduated from college, I wanted to go active duty and uh, uh, threw my uh, name in the hat to go and get selected for uh, the officer training program. And uh, the recruiter came back and said, um, well, you know, with all this technical background you've got, you know, your electronic warfare, uh, uh, all this, all this uh, physics and math, um, we'd like you to be a contracting officer. (laughs) <laughs> it's like that doesn't make any sense to me at all it's amazing so how they actually it's amazing how they actually come up with what you're going to do i don't think it really has anything to do with what your background is <laughs> well it was needs of the air force at the time yep and so so immediately my first thought was oh no way no i am i'm not interested that's nothing but paperwork i i hate paperwork right so i called a buddy of mine in the guard and he said oh no wait a minute somebody is buying all that high tech stuff that the Air Force is playing with out there. So it may be worth uh, going off and doing that. And yeah. then uh, my thought was, okay, I'm going to go be a contracting officer and jump uh, into another career field the first chance I get. So 30 years later, I retired as a contracting officer. <laughs> that is funny. But you know what's funny? I actually, I, I actually ended up enjoying it quite a bit. No, I know you were, uh, you were always really passionate about it. Um, what I was going to say is funny is I remember when I came in, needed the Air Force, they needed navigators, right? Um, and uh, I think they got rid of all the navigators when GPS came out during, you know, Desert Storm, they were using it. And then they realized, well, GPS doesn't work quite as good as we think it does, especially when, you know, ammo is involved or, you know, dropping troops somewhere. So, um, but uh, as I came in, I'm like, well, you know, I don't think there's a lot of, I wanted to fly, so I didn't care. But I'm like, you know, I don't think there's a lot of jobs for navigators, outside of the air force i'm like what and i was just asking like recruiters and the flight training officer i'm like what jobs like translate besides pilot like what translates into a job like a civilian job because you always hear about veterans that can't get jobs after they get out they're like if you want to if you want a high paying job where people are coming after you and you have a skill set that companies can use you want to be in acquisitions you want to be a contracting officer a program manager or an engineer and i kind of thought the same thing you did i'm like yeah sounds like a lot of paperwork but then eventually i got transitioned into that um and i really enjoyed it too but um i think it's interesting that uh uh just from that perspective i'll tell you what what uh worked well for me i do hate people and so I found that uh, I took uh, an, a, an approach of, I do not like to repeat paperwork over and over again. So I decided I'm just gonna really understand it. I'm gonna understand what the requirement is. I wanna do it one time and get out of here. Uh, so my bosses and program managers, as I was a young uh, you know, guy coming up through the, they loved it. They loved it because I just got serious about it. I, I, I would blast through all these acquisition timelines i was always on time because i didn't have to re keep redoing the paperwork um yep. so so me hating paperwork and being lazy about it uh ultimately made me very good at it it paid off uh, it paid off 
Yeah, it did. That's it's interesting um, because it, there's so there's so many different pieces to the government acquisitions process. This is part of what I want to talk about. Yeah. A lot of people, but what people go to is the contracting officer. So if they know one position, it's it's the CEO, right? And yeah. um, you know whether it is, hey, I'm a small business doing business development. You know, trying to find an opportunity, they see the contracting officer's name on something, or they want to learn more about a program. Like contracting officer, I mean, if you know where to find the published contracts and whatnot, you can usually find out who is involved. Uh, but like you mentioned, there's also program managers, there's engineers, there's finance people, there's a lot of different players involved in the contracting process. I have my own thoughts on this, but you know, just from your experience, when is it a good time for the company, a company, to reach out to the contracting officer? When is it appropriate for them to, to try to talk to the program manager um, or, you know, or another position? Uh, well, like with everything, it depends. Uh, yep. there, there's a thousand factors to take into account. But you know, generically speaking, uh, early on in an acquisition, when the program manager is doing fact finding and they just need to understand what's out there, what's the art of possible, you know, what are the, uh, you know, what companies are doing, you know, what, what's the capabilities uh, available. So market it's research. Appropriate. Yeah. Market research. It's appropriate at that time to talk directly to the program manager and, you know, you can try to influence, but you know, that's fine. But then there's a point where it becomes actually a funded acquisition or a acquisition that's going to, you know, go through the formal process. Once it becomes formal, then all of that interaction should be with the contracting team, the contract manager, negotiator, you know, uh, contracting uh, administrative side, uh, because everything has to be like uh, collectively, uh, you know, pulled together, uh, and and that will drive all the um, the programmatic or the acquisition documents, if you will. So at, at that point, it's very appropriate to work with the contracting officer. Okay. Once the contract is awarded then it's very appropriate on a day-to-day -day basis to execute with the program manager. Now, the second you're talking about making any changes or doing something that will drive cost, scope, or performance or anything like that, you get the contracting officer back in the mix. Uh, and the program managers should know that. And uh, most of the time, they are uh, coming to the contracting officer way past the point where they've already worked the deal. You're kidding um, me. There's, it's not a perfectly oiled machine? Uh, well, you know, you would hope, but uh, no, I, in fact, I remember you doing that to me at least one time. <laughs> I probably did. Probably did multiple times, multiple times. I was just reading, I was just reading uh, a little uh, history of acquisitions, go, just going back to the Revolutionary War, which is, I thought, really interesting. Oh, nice. Um, but one of the, uh, I, I underlined this, exasperating slowness is the hallmark of the military weapons acquisitions process. And then it goes on, it goes on to explain why. But yeah. There, but there is. I mean, there's so many uh, people involved with government acquisitions that, you know, like you said, like you might have a PM that's going in late. Um, you know, of course, you also might have companies reaching out to the wrong people and uh, yeah. not really understanding um, where to go. There's a have you ever heard of the contracting officer podcast? I don't. I don't know if I have. There's a, yeah, it's, if you're not in the podcast, you probably have. But uh, there's, a, there's a podcast called the contracting officer podcast. It's actually really good. Um, it's two, uh, former, I think military contracting officers, um, that are no, no longer active duty, but, uh, what they described like the relationship between the contracting officer and the program manager as uh, a wedding in, in the business. Right. And they basically said, Hey, the, the contracting officer is the priest at a wedding. Like think of them as the priest. They have like the legal authority to marry the bride, which is the program manager and the government, to the groom, which is the business, right? The, the, and the, your, the small business owner wants to marry, wants to get married. So the bride is, you know, kind of going on dates with all of these grooms here, maybe during the market research phase. But in the end, someone with legal authority has to be able to put them together, right? And they, that was their kind of simple exp explanation of, hey, so that's the contracting officer. And then, you know, you got to spend the rest of your life with, you know, the bride until you get a divorce. But um, yeah, I haven't heard that one, but I can, I yeah. can appreciate, I can appreciate that. Yeah, I thought that was interesting, but um, I probably mentioned it on here before too. So, you uh, you grew up in the acquisitions world, and how long did you spend in the military? Well, I was over thirty years uh, all altogether. Um, so, I was six years in the guard doing uh, F four stuff, and uh, then probably twenty five plus years 
uh, active duty uh, in the acquisition community. Now, I went in and out of acquisition. I did some command and control stuff, like I said, and some yeah. uh, political affairs as well. But um, the uh, you know, I I was a brand new lieutenant as a contracting officer uh, in uh, Hanscom Air Force Base in Massachusetts. Um, you know, jumping into major weapon system acquisitions. Yeah. And uh, you know, got in, and and I was uh, involved in that. In a couple of places, I was the contracting officer, the f- the financial management. The price analyst and the program manager all at the same time. I was working in environments where everything was very limited, so I had to do all of it. So I've been a program manager. I've been the the finance guy. I've been the budget analyst. I've been the price analyst. I've been the uh, you know all the all the different pieces that you see in the acquisition machine. Yeah, and that's interesting. So that's probably just with that and your um, desire not to have to do paperwork over and over again. <laughs> yeah. um, so that led, and you know, for people that aren't familiar with the military, your reward in the military for doing a good job is being given more work, more responsibility, yeah. more work, more responsibility, and eventually, kind of the culmination of that, you know, is that is being uh, given a command, right? So, so you were a commander many times over. I was a commander five times. That's crazy. So, that's that yeah. Not it something- was. It was crazy. <laughs> so, uh, and what what does that mean for anyone listening? Uh, okay, so to be a commander means that you are the one responsible for the execution of that particular mission. So uh, ultimately, that's that's what it boils down to, responsibility. And uh, then you have people that, uh, you know, work for you. And in the military environment, uh, when you're a commander and you have military members appointed underneath you, you have a really an, uh, an amazing level of responsibility for their success and failures. And, um, uh, and, and you can really, uh, you know, have a, a lot of responsibility for um, their success in life as well. Uh, so uh, there, there's a, there's quite a level of uh, detail on the personnel management side of command, but the mission management side of command, you know, I don't think people really, really understand that, you know, everything that a team does uh, the commanders are are really ultimately watching or at the end of the day, totally responsible for the success or failure. Uh, and a lot of times in the military, when you see something has gone horribly wrong, you don't really see what happened to the soldiers, sailor, airmen, or Marines. You see what happens to the commanders. Right. Uh, this, this commander was removed because, you know, this thing happened in, underneath their command. So uh, that responsibility uh, is, you know, you're responsible for a lot of things you have no control over. So you have to create environments. And in acquisition, you have to create this environment of uh, like the, uh, an approach, like an attitude almost about, um, you know, how people are going to behave and, uh, you know, follow the rules and how they're going to perform within that, uh, how they're going to take their responsibilities to their program managers, or their customers seriously and, you know, um, you know, not be the typical government uh, employee that, uh, you know, everybody's uh, uh, got a good stereotype on. Right. Uh, I think that that probably answers your question. No, that's no, that that's perfect. So, I mean, in driving your team to to get what needs to get done um, quickly and, you know, have a positive attitude. I mean, you're right. Everything kind of trickles uh, downstream. But I wanted to give people that perspective of you because, you know, well, I guess I technically met you first at Hanscom Air Force Base. So you were back there and you were already a colonel. Then we were out and I was in Saudi managing FMS out there, but you actually had a much bigger portfolio than just one country. Um, I don't know if you care to talk about that at all, but so now we're talking foreign military sales, right? So our government selling to other countries or other governments? Yeah, so anytime the US government uh, is managing a defense contract for supplies, equipment, uh, in some case services, uh, uh, over certain thresholds, defense contract management agency, this uh, th- their, their job is to help administer those giant contracts anywhere in the world. Uh, because you you it, it really takes a pretty big effort to administer these really big contracts. So my job there was uh, I was commander for all defense contracts were being executed in the Middle East, in Africa, and some other countries in those areas. So we had a pretty broad uh, you know area of responsibility. Not a, not that there was tons of contracts uh, across Africa, but we we did have some. Um, the big ones were right there in the Middle East. So sure. we would uh, oversee the execution of some of these contracts in that location. Uh, the actual contracts were written 
uh, by contracting uh, activities back in the United States, and then they would assign the oversight, quality assurance, you know, uh, various other things uh, uh, on the production line to the uh, the DCMA uh, men and women out there in the Middle East. So it's it was interesting. Uh, it was really fascinating to see how different countries and different uh, companies would uh, operate in different countries, and how they were able to, um, you know, set the stage for them for their uh, operations. Yeah, no, I mean it was, it was definitely interesting work. And so, I mean, you've basically you've seen basically it all, right? I mean, you've seen a lot of the oh, different. I don't know if I've seen it all. Well, you've, well, there's a there's a lot to see, but you know, you, you yeah. spent a lot of time in procurement in the states uh, with the military, from you know you know, advanced weaponry to, you know, maybe more mundane uh, things and then for military sales. And you mentioned some diplomatic work, but now we're both retired, right? So uh, obviously you have an expertise. Um, you probably have a few expertises, right? So, uh, but some of the things in, you know, just for anyone listening that, you know, we'll talk to, and is, I think my listeners know, I, I help a lot of uh, businesses sell to the government and, Typically, I'm focused on business development and strategy, um, getting started, getting to that point where you're consistently winning contracts. But the real work starts once you're on contract, right? That's a uh, that's a saying I've heard uh, over and over again, and it and it's true, right? That's when you're actually executing and, and delivering or producing whatever it is that the government is asked you for, and that's when I bring Colonel Orndorff in uh, to to troubleshoot for us and uh, and to help businesses with you know whether it is. Uh, with the proposal process, if they needed something reviewed or or just, you know, hey, there's a problem set, you know, with the contract, how can we how can we fix this termination for convenience is one that we worked on. Um, maybe we could start there. What What's termination for convenience? And, you know, what should uh, a company be thinking if, if it happens to them? Uh, well, term, termination for convenience is when the government decides, for whatever reason, uh, we no longer need this uh, supply service or, you know, uh, wh whatever it is. Um, so there's a lot of rules that go along with that. But there's a lot of things that a company can actually come out financially ahead than where they were. It doesn't mean that you drop everything and you lose everything you've sunk into the effort. Um, you know, there's a there's a lot of things that you can do there. But but the key is I'll, I'll kind of go back to what you said. You know, you help people get to that point where there's contract award, and you know, I know you're, you you do that well. Um, but inevitably, there's going to be something that goes wrong. Uh, and, and this is where, you know, I like to think we've had some really good, uh, you know, opportunities to help companies. Um, inevitably, there's there's things that go wrong, and it can be for any number of reasons that are your fault or not your fault. Uh, and that's where, you know, you quickly find yourself outside of any skill set that any reasonable person should even have. Right. Um, yeah, so, so you want to you want to find some uh, allies in the in the journey on that one, and uh, I think that's uh, that's just like that. Termination for convenience is one of those. Um, you know, equitable adjustments. You know, uh, your entire supply chain just went up massively in in price. Uh, so, how do you pass those costs and prices on to the government uh, without you know you know you agree to a certain price? Pandemic hits. Now you know you're going to have to charge more for a thousand reasons. Yep. You know, how do you how do you how do you work through all those details? Um, again, there's there's um, every section of the federal acquisition regulation covers you know various uh, aspects of things that can go wrong. There are guidelines that uh, you know try to keep things from going wrong, but when they do, you know that's where you know, most people are, have no idea whether whether or not that's their uh, cybersecurity uh, system. Uh, I didn't know I needed that. What do I do now? I mm -hmm. didn't sign up for that. I didn't realize I signed up for that. Um, I didn't account for the actual cost that that would, uh, you know, uh, impact my company. Uh, you know, all kinds of things like that. So yeah, no, you're right. It, it can be. Uh, I don't know how many times I've um, talked to a business where you know the RFP to their to their credit was kind of big in some areas. You know, mm -hmm. um, and you've pointed out too. And you know, we're not gonna we're not gonna deep dive on the the fire here but um you know there are times i've had conversations with uh with you many times where we talked about the nuance of the way a uh, an rfp is written right so sometimes the the way a contracting officer is going to write an rfp or an rfq you know there are it could just be a fire reference it could be uh, something else that they put in there which you know the layman you know and myself included right i might read that uh from a a PM hat in, on and and not get exactly what the contracting officer was getting at there. Or, you know, if I, if I go back to being in, I might've, 
you know, ask the contracting officer, hey, this is kind of the intent, or this is what we're we're getting after, or we have a requirement. But you know, the CEO knows they have to put some language in there, legal language, to to really get what the government needs. And that's where, you know, again, like you reviewing some of those things, um, you know, it's it it's a it's a helpful advantage for a business to to get that advice and get that perspective as they're, you know, writing their proposal and, and trying to land that contract initially. Yeah, and this is you know again, um, uh, you can read what a reasonable person would read and answer in a reasonable way, but you miss uh, all sorts of decades of like uh, those nuances that come from both the program side and the contract side and some other areas within the public sector uh, acquisitions. So you know it's it's nice uh, to have somebody look at it before you get into trouble. That's my favorite thing is, you know, yeah. try to try to get way ahead of, uh, you know, uh, stepping into some of those landmines. But once you do step on one of those landmines, you know, calling up uh, uh, Richard Howard and associates and saying, uh, hey, help us out. You know, that's that's uh, that's that's where you really need somebody who's been there and, and uh, navigated a few of those problems. And I'll, I'll say this one thing about uh, being the commander for DCMA. I was a commander for DCMA three different times, uh, one in plant. Uh, for a, a major manufacturer in the United States. And one um, in the war zone over in Afghanistan, I was uh, the commander for DCMA Southern Afghanistan, and then the one we talked about in the Middle East. What you do from an administrative perspective is, is really all you do is solve the, the problems that uh, um, when the contracting team and the company put together the contract, they didn't foresee everything. So right. ultimately, the government has to solve problems um, with the contractor. So I spent a lot of time uh, as that commander making sure that we were putting really good solutions on the table and finding ways to go forward and keep, um, you know, minimize impact to the mission at the end of the day. So uh, I've seen a lot of uh, how things don't work um, and uh, uh, hopefully found a lot of ways to help them get back on track. I'll tell you, uh, the person I call when I don't know the answer <laughs> so it's just a couple of weeks ago at a conference. I, uh, I'm like, Hey, what, you know, we're trying to do this. So I, I think our listeners know that I, I do some selling for one of our clients, uh, too. So, um, mm -hmm. no, it, I mean, it, it, great advice and thanks for coming on the podcast today. So this has been an awesome conversation. Um, if anybody is on contract and has questions, if anybody wants uh, a contracting officer, a former contracting officer to review a proposal they're putting together. Uh, absolutely. You can reach out to me uh, through DOD Contract Academy um, or uh, Richard at richardchoward.com. Um, and you can, I'll put you uh, with uh, Colonel Warndorf. We'll talk about what your situation is and see um, see what the project looks like. But uh, again, uh, you know, Colonel, thanks for coming on here. Do you have any parting thoughts for the, the masses uh, before we end the podcast today? Uh, I have, uh, I, I would say um, it's really fascinating to work in the government space, you know, in the public sector space. Uh, but with it comes uh, something you, you mentioned earlier that those timelines, um, you know, as you go through and you are doing your business planning and your strategies, uh, one thing, just build in extra time for everything, uh, every extra time for getting your payments made, extra time for completing milestones. Just just build in that, that factor to begin with. Not every government team is going to be super proactive and try to like, you know, reduce those timelines. I know a lot of government teams, they're like, hey, this is the timeline and uh, this is how much time we have and this is how much time it's going to take and um, I'm not in any hurry. And uh, so one of the things from a business perspective is if you if you just acknowledge that and, and just say, OK, this is most likely case scenario, let's let's build that. And then best case scenarios, we can reduce that. Um, if you want to understand where some of that is, you know, obviously reach out. Uh, we can help you with that. Um, but, uh, you know, that 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 time frame is the problem that has been uh, struggled with. For the, I mean, you can. It go goes back to the Revolutionary War. I'm, I'm looking at it right you here. Go way past the Revolutionary War. You can go yep. back a lot further than that. Uh, can, I think you can go can. back uh, to the beginning of, uh, you know, the first concept of a contract and ah. why is this taking so long? Uh, and in some cases, there's a good reason, but in a lot of cases, you know, I just, uh, there, you know, you you manage what you can manage, but um, we we can help you figure some of that out. 
Yeah, you know, that, that's that's just a final thought. I mean, contracting is complicated. Acquisition is uh, lucrative, and there's some really good things to do out there. But uh, the the train doesn't necessarily roll on your, your time frame. So um, you you got to if you can wrap your brain around that, then uh, it's actually a pretty interesting environment to uh, operate in. That's all I've got. Well, I'm sure that's not all you've got, but that's uh, that's all the time we've got for today. All right. Well, hey, thanks again for coming on. Uh, for everyone listening, thank you. Please subscribe to the podcast, leave a review, and head over to dodcontract.com, see some of the programs we have available. I can hook you up with Lou if we have something for you, and then we'll see you next time. Thank you.